Hello, friends. Happy Thursday. And we continue with the massive Act 4 of The Taming of the Shrew, for which I will be using the sound machine. Also, yesterday I put some stuff in my hair to stop it moving around. I haven't washed that off yet, so sorry for the state of me. Also, sorry as ever for how roughly cut together the whole thing is. The story so far, Petruccio has married Catherine. Petruccio's friend Hortensio has decided to give up his pursuit of Catherine's sister Bianca after seeing how well she was getting on with her tutor, who is actually Lucentio in disguise. Lucentio's servant Tranio is pretending to be Lucentio to create a distraction. However, now Tranio must find someone to pretend to be Lucentio Vincentio's father, Vincentio, in order to arrange a dowry with Bianca's father, Baptista. Assisting them is Lucentio's other servant, Biondello. And if all that seems too much to keep track of, don't worry, because today we also see the introduction of Curtis, Nathaniel, Philip, Joseph, Peter, a haberdasher, a tailor, a pedant, which here means a uh, schoolmaster, although schoolmastering doesn't really come into it, and another character whose identity will remain a secret until the end of the act. So enjoy. Ta-da! Act 4, Scene 1. Enter Grumio. Fie, fie, and all tired jades, and all mad masters, and all foul ways. Was ever man so beaten? Was ever man so raped? Was ever man so weary? I am come before to make a fire, and they are coming after to warm them. Now... Were not I a little pot and soon hot, my very lips might freeze to my teeth, my tongue to the roof of my mouth, my heart in my belly, ere I should come by a fire to thaw me, but I with blowing the fire shall warm myself, for considering the weather, a taller man than I will take cold. Holla ho, Curtis! Enter Curtis. Who is it that calls so coldly? A piece of ice. If thou doubt it, thou mayst slide from my shoulder to my heel with no greater a run but mine head and my neck. A fire, good Curtis. Is my master and his wife coming, Grumio? Oh, I, Curtis, I am there for fire, fire, cast on no water. Is she so hot a shrew as she's reported? Well, she was, good Curtis, before this frost. But thou knowest winter tames man, woman, and beast, for it hath tamed my old master and my new mistress, and myself, fellow Curtis. Oh, eh, you three inch fool. I'm no beast. Oh, am I but three inches? Why, thy horn is a foot, and so long am I at the least. But wilt thou make a fire, or shall I complain on thee to our mistress, whose hand she being now at hand, thou shalt soon feel to thy cold comfort for being slow in thy hot office? I prithee, good groom, you. Tell me, how goes the world? A cold world, Curtis, in every office but thine, and therefore fire, do thy duty, and have thy duty, for my master and mistress are almost frozen to death. Well, there's fire ready, and therefore, good Grumio, the news. Why, Jack, boy, ho, boy, and as much news as wilt thou. Oh, come, you're, you're so full of coney catching. Why, therefore, fire, for I have caught extreme cold. Where's the cook? Is supper ready? The house trimmed, rushes through, cobwebs swept, the serving men in their new fustian, the white stockings, and every officer his wedding garment on? Be the jacks fair within, the jills fair without, the carpets laid, and everything in order? All ready! And therefore I pray thee, news! First, oh, my horse is tired, my master and mistress fallen out. How? Out of their saddles into the dirt, and thereby hangs a tail. Well, let's hide, good Grumio. Lend thine ear. Here, there. Ah. <laughs> oh, this is to feel a tale, not to hear a tale. And therefore, it is called a sensible tale. And this cuff was but to knock at your ear and beseech listening. Now I begin. Imprimis, we came down a foul hill, my master riding behind my mistress. Both of one horse. What's that to thee? Why, a horse? Well, tell thou the tale. But hadst thou not crossed me, Thou shouldst have heard how her horse fell, and she under her horse. Thou shouldst have heard in how miry a place, how she was bemoiled, how he left her with the horse upon her, how he beat me because her horse stumbled, how she waded through the dirt to pluck him off me, how he swore, how she prayed that never prayed before, how I cried, how the horses ran away, how her bridle was burst, how I lost my crapper with many things of worthy memory which now shall die in oblivion, and thou return unexperienced to thy grave. By this reckoning, he's more shrill than she. Aye, 
and that thou and the proudest of you all shall find when he comes home. But what talk I of this? Call forth Nathaniel, Joseph, Nicholas, Philip, Walter, Sugarsop, and the rest. Let their heads be sleekly combed, their blue coats brushed, and their garters of an indifferent knit. Let them curtsy with their left legs, and not presume to touch a hair of my master's horse tail till they kiss their hands. Are they all ready? They are. Call them forth. Do you hear her? You must be my master to countenance my mistress. Why, she hath a face of her own. Well, who knows not that? Thou it seems that calls for company to countenance her. I call them forth to credit her. Enter four or five serving men. Why, she comes to borrow nothing of them. Welcome, good Groomio. Hannah, Groomio. What Groomio? Fellow Groomio. Hannah, old lad. Gro welcome you. How old are you? What you, fellow you? And thus much for greeting. Now, my spruce companions is all ready and all things neat. All things is ready. How neat is our master? In at hand, slighted by this, and therefore be not. Cox, passion, silence! And here, my master, enter Petruccio and Catherine. Where be these names? What, no man at the door to hold my stirrup nor to take my horse? Where's Nathaniel Gregory Philip? Here, sir, here, sir, here, sir, here, sir, here, sir, here, sir. You logger-headed and unpolished grooms. What, no attendance? No regard, no duty? Where's the foolish knave I said before? Here, sir, as foolish as I was before. You peasant swain, you horse, son. Maul hers, drudge. Did I not bid thee meet me in the park and bring along these rascal knaves with thee? Uh, Nathaniel's coat, sir, was not fully made, and Gabriel's pumps were all unpinked in the heel, and there was no link to colour Peter's hat, and Walter's dagger was not come from sheathing. There were none fine but Adam, Ralph, and Gregory. The rest were ragged, old, and beggarly. Yet, as they are, here they are come to meet you. Go, rascals, go and fetch my supper in. <laughs> Exeunt servants. Where is the life that laid I left? Where are those? Sit down, Catherine, and uh, welcome. Suit, 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 suit. Enter servants with supper. <laughs> what? When I say? No, good sweet. Be merry. Off with my boots, you rogues, you villains. When? It was the friar of orders grey as he forth walked on his way. Gah, you rogue! You plucked my foot awry. Take that. <clears throat> and may the plucking of the other. Be merry, Kate. Uh, some water here. What ho? Enter one with water. Where's my spaniel Troiler? Sirrah, get your hints, and bid my cousin Ferdinand come hither. One Kate that you must kiss and be acquainted with. Where are my slippers? Shall I have some water? Come, Kate, and wash and welcome heart. Poor <laughs> son, villain! Will you let it fall? Catherine, patience, I pray you. Twas a fault unwilling, a horse and beetle headed, flop eared knave. Come, Kate, sit you down. I know you have a stomach. Oh, will you give thanks to cat or shall I? What's this, mutton? I? Who brought it? I? It is burnt. And so is all the meat. What dogs are these? Where's the rascal cook? How durst you villains bring it from the dresser and serve it thus to me that love it not? There! Ugh. Take it to you, crutches, caps and all! You headless joltheads and unmannered slaves! Swallow what, what do you grumble? I'll be with you straight! He chases the servants away. I pray you, husband, be not so disquiet. The meat was well, if you were so contented. I tell thee, Kate, t'was burnt and dried away, and I expressly am forbid to touch it, for it engenders choler. Uh, planeth anger. And better twere that both of us did fast, since of ourselves ourselves are choleric, than feed it with such over-roasted flesh. Be patient. Tomorrow it shall be mended. And for this night we'll fast for company. Come, I'll bring thee to thy bridal chamber. Exeunt. Enter servants. Severally. Peter, didst ever see the like? He kills her in her own humour. Enter Curtis. Where is he? In her chamber, making a sermon of continency to her, and rails and swears and rates that she, poor soul, knows not which way to stand, to look, to speak, and sits as one new risen from a dream. Oh, away, away, for he's coming hither. Exeunt. Enter Petruchio. Oh. Ah. Thus have I politically begun my reign, and tis my hope to end successfully. My falcon now is sharp and passing empty until she stoop. She must not be full-gorged, for then she never looks upon her lure. Another way I have to man my haggard, to make her come, and though her keeper's call, that is to watch her, as we watch these kites that bait and beat and will not be obedient. She ate no meat today, nor none shall eat. Last night she slept not, nor tonight she shall. As with the meat... Some undeserved fault I'll find about the making of the bed. And here I'll fling the pillow, there the bolster, this way the coverlet, another way the sheets I, and amid this hurly, I intend that all is done in reverent care of her. 
And in conclusion, she shall watch all night. And if she chance to nod, I'll rail and brawl and with the clamour keep her still awake. This is a way to kill a wife with kindness, and thus I'll curb her mad and headstrong humour. He that better knows how to tame a shrew. Now let him speak. Tis charity to show. Exit. Scene two. Enter Tranio as Lucentio and Hortensio as Licio. Is it possible, friend Licio, that Mistress Bianca doth fancy any other but Lucentio? I tell you, sir, she bears me fair in hand. Sir, well, to satisfy you in what I have said, stand by and mark the manner of his teaching. They stand aside. Enter Bianca and Lucentio as Cambio. Now, mistress, profit you in what you read. What master read you? First resolve me that. I read that I profess the art to love, and may you prove, sir, master of your art. Why, well, you, sweet dear, prove mistress of my heart. They stand aside. Quick proceeders, marry. Now tell me, I pray, you that durst swear that your mistress Bianca loved none in the world so well as Lucentio. Oh, despiteful love, unconstant womankind, I tell thee, Licio, this is wonderful. Mistake no more. I am not Licio, nor a musician, as I seem to be, but one that scorned to live in this disguise for such a one as leaves a gentleman and makes a god of such a cullion. No, sir, that I am called Hortensio. Signor Hortensio! I have often heard of your entire affection to Bianca, and since mine eyes are witness of her likeness, I will, with you, if you be so contented, forswear Bianca and her love forever. See how they kiss and court. Signor Lucentio, here is my hand, and here I firmly vow never to woo her more, but do forswear her as one unworthy all the former favours that I have fondly flattered her withal. And here I take the like unfeigned oath, never to marry with her though she would entreat. Fie on her. See how beastly she doth court him. Oh, will all the world but he had quite forsworn. For me, that I may surely keep mine oath, I will be married to a wealthy widow ere three days pass, which hath as long loved me as I have loved this proud, disdainful haggard. And so farewell, Signor Lucentio. Kindness in women, not their beauteous looks, shall win my love. And so I take my leave in resolution, as I swore before. Exit. Uh, Mistress Bianca, bless you with such grace as longeth to a lover's blessed case. They have done you napping, gentle love, and have forsworn you with Hortensio. Tranio, you jest, but have you both forsworn me? Mistress, we have. Then we're rid of Licio. If faith, he'll have a lusty widow now that shall be wooed and wedded in a day. Oh, God give him joy. Aye, and he'll tame her. He says so, Tranio. Faith, he's gone unto the taming school. The taming school? What, is there such a place? Ay, mistress, and Petruchio is the master that teacheth tricks eleven and twenty long to tame a shrew and charm her chattering tongue. Enter Biondello. Oh, master, master, I've watched so long that I'm dog-weary, but at last I spied an ancient angel coming down the hill will serve the turn. What is he, Biondello? Master, a mercantante, a pedant, I know not what, but formal in apparel, in gait and countenance, surely like her father. And what of him, Tranio? Well, if he be credulous and trust my tale, I'll make him glad to seem Vincentio and give assurance to Baptista Manola as if he were the right Vincentio. Take in your love and then let me alone. Accent Lucentio and Bianca. Enter a pedant. God save you, sir. And you, sir, you are welcome. Travel you far on or uh, are you at the farthest? Sir, at the farthest for a week or two, but then up farther and as far as Rome, and so to Tripoli, if God lend me life. What countryman, I pray? Of Mantua. Of Mantua? Sir, marry, God forbid. And come to Padua, careless of your life? My, my life, sir? How I pray, for that goes hard. Tis death for anyone in Mantua to come to Padua. Know you not the cause? Your ships have stayed at Venice, and the Duke, for private quarrel twixt your Duke and him, hath published and proclaimed it openly. Tis marvel, but you are but newly come. You might have heard it else proclaimed about. Well, alas, sir, it is worse for me than so, for I have bills for money by exchange from Florence, and must here deliver them. Well, sir, do you courtesy? This will I do. At this I will advise you. Uh, Paul, first, tell me, have you ever been at Pisa? 
I say in Pisa have I often been, Pisa renowned for grave citizens. Among them know you one Vincentio? I know him not, but I have heard of him, a merchant of incomparable wealth. He is my father, sir, and swift to say in countenance somewhat doth resemble you, Biondello, as much as an apple doth an oyster, and all one. Now to save your life in this extremity, this favour will I do you for his sake, and think it not the worst of all your fortunes that you are like to, Sir Vincentio. His name and credit shall you undertake, and in my house you shall be friendly lodged. Look that you take upon you as you should, you understand me, sir? So shall you stay till you have done your business in the city. If this be courtesy, sir, accept of it. Oh, sir, I do, and will repute you ever the patron of my life and liberty. Then go with me to make the matter good. Oh, ah, this, by the way, I let you understand. My father is here looked for every day to pass assurance of a dower in marriage twixt me and one Baptista's daughter here. In all these circumstances, I'll instruct you. Go with me to clothe you as becomes you. Excellent. Scene three. Enter Catherine and Grumio. No, no, forsooth, I dare not for my life. The more my wrong, the more his spite appears. What, did he marry me to famish me? Beggars that come unto my father's door upon entreaty have a present arms, or if not elsewhere they meet with charity. But I, who never knew how to entreat, nor never needed that I should entreat, am starved for meat, giddy for lack of sleep, with oaths kept waking and with brawling fed, and that which spites me more than all these ones, he does it under name of perfect love, as who should say if I should sleep or eat, twere deadly sickness or else present death. I prithee, go and get me some repast, I care not what, so it be wholesome food. What say you to a uh, neat's foot? Tis passing good, I prithee, let me have it. Oh, no, I fear it is too choleric a meat. How say you to a fat tripe finely broiled? I like it well, good Grumio, fetch it me. No, I cannot tell, I fear it is choleric. What say you to a piece of beef and mustard? A dish that I do love to feed upon. Aye, but the mustard is too hot a little. Why then the beef and let the mustard rest? Oh, nay, then I will not. You shall have the mustard, or else you'd have no beef of Grumio. Well, then both or one or anything thou wilt. Why then the mustard without the beef. Go! Get thee gone, thou false deluding slave! Thou feeds me with the very name of meat! Sorrow on thee, and all the pack of you that triumph thus against my misery! Go get thee gone, I say! Enter Petruccio and Hortensio with meat. How fares my kite? Ah, oh, what sweeting, all a mort. Uh, mistress, what cheer? <sighs> Faith as cold as can be. Pluck up thy spirits, look cheerfully upon me. Here, love, thou seest how diligent I am to dress thy meat myself. And bring it thee. I'm sure, sweet Kate, this kindness merits thanks. What? Not a word? Well, no, then thou lovest it not, and all my pains is sorted to no proof. Here, take away the dish. I pray you, let it stand. The poorest service is repaid with thanks, and so shall mine before you touch the meat. I thank you, sir. Uh, Signor Petruccio, fie, you are to blame. Come, Mistress Kate, I'll bear you company. Eat it all up, Hortensio, if thou lovest me. Much good do it unto thy gentle heart. Kate, eat a pace. And now, my honey love, will we return unto thy father's house and revel it as bravely as the rest with silken coats and caps and golden rings with ruffs and cuffs and farthingales and things with scarves and fans and double change of bravery with amber bracelets, beads and all this knavery. Ah, oh, what, hast thou died? The tailor stays thy leisure to deck thy body with this ruffling treasure. Enter tailor with the gown. Come, tailor, let us see these ornaments. Slay forth the gown. Enter haberdasher with a cap. What news with you, sir? Well, here is the cap your worship did bespeak. What? This was moulded on a porringer, a velvet dish. Fie, fie, tis lewd and filthy. Why, it is a cockle or a walnut shell, a knack, a toy, a trick, a baby's cap. Now, away with it. Come, let me have a bigger. I'll have no bigger. It's to fit the time, and gentlewomen wear such caps as these. Well, when you are gentle, you shall have one too, and not till then. That will not be in haste. Why, sir, I trust I may have leave to speak, and speak I will. I am no child, no babe. Your betters have endured me, say my mind, and if you cannot, well, best you stop your ears. My tongue will tell the anger of my heart, or else my heart concealing it will break, and rather than it shall, I will be free, even to the uttermost as I please, in words. Why, thou sayest true. It is a paltry cap, a custard coffin, a bauble, a silken pie. I love thee well in that thou likest it not. Love me or love me not, I like the cap, and it I will have, or I will have none. Exit Haberdasher. 
Thy gown? Ah, oh, what's ah? Oh, come, Taylor. Let's see it. Oh, mercy. God, what masking stuff is here? What's this? A sleeve? It's like a Debbie cannon. What, up and down, carved like an apple tart? Is snip and nip and cut and slish and slash like to a scissor at a barber's shop? Why, what a devil's name Taylor calls out this? I see she's like to have no cap nor gown. You bid me make it orderly and well according to the fashion and the time. Or marry, uh, and did, but if you remembered, I did not bid you mar it to the time. Go hop me over every kennel home for you shall hop without my custom, sir. Oh, none of it. Heads, make your best of it. I never saw a better fashioned gown, more quaint, more pleasing, nor more commendable. But like you mean to make a puppet of me? Why, true, he means to make a puppet of thee. Uh, no, she says your worship means to make a puppet of her. <laughs> oh, monstrous arrogance. Thou liest, thou thread, thou thimble, thou yard, three-quarter, half-yard, quarter-nail, thou flea, thou knit, thou winter cricket, thou braved in mine own house with a skein of thread. Away, thou rag, thou quantity, thou remnant, or I shall so bemeet thee with thy yard as thou shalt think on prattling whilst thou livest. I tell thee I that thou hast marred her gown. Your worship is deceived. The, 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 the gown is made just as my master had direction. Grumio gave order how it should be done. I gave him no order. I gave him the stuff. But, but how did you desire it should be made? Or oh, marry, sir, with needle and thread. But did you not request to have it cut? Thou hast faced many things. Oh, I have. Face not me. Thou hast braved many men. Brave not me. I will neither be faced nor braved. I say unto thee, I bid thy master cut out the gown, but I did not bid him cut it to pieces, ergo thou liest. Well, well, here is the note of the fashion to testify. Read it. The note lies in his throat, if you say I said so. Well, in primis, a loose-bodied gown. Master, if ever I said loose-bodied gown, sew me in the skirts of it, and beat me to death with the bottom of a brown thread. I said a gown. Proceed. Uh, with a small compassed cape, I confess the cape, with a trunk sleeve, I confess, two sleeves, with sleeves curiously cut. Aye, right, there's the villainy. Enter in the bill, sir, enter in the bill. I command the sleeves should be cut out and sewed up again, and that I'll prove upon thee, though thy little finger be armed in a thimble. This is true that I say, and I have thee in place where thou shouldst know it. I am for thee streaks. Take thou the bill. Give me the meat yard and spare not me. Thank God a mercy, Grumio, then he shall have no odds. Well, sir, in brief, the gown is not for me. Well, you are right, sir. It is for my mistress. Go, take it up into thy master's use. Oh, <laughs> villain, not for thy life. Take up my mistress' gown for thy master's use. Oh, I say. What's your conceit in this? Oh, sir, the conceit is deeper than you think for. Take up my mistress' gown from my master's use. Oh, uh, fie, fie, fie. Hortensio, say thou wilt see the tailor paid. Go take it, Eds. Be gone and say no more. Uh, tailor, I'll pay thee for thy gown tomorrow. Take no unkindness of his hasty words. Away, I say. Uh, commend thee to thy master. Well, come, my cat. We will unto your fathers even in these honest mean habiliments. Our purses shall be proud, our garments poor. For tis the mind that makes the body rich, and as the sun breaks through the darkest cloud, so honour peereth in the meanest habits. What? Is the jay more precious than the lark? because his feathers are more beautiful? Or is the adder better than the eel, because his painted skin contents the eye? Oh no, good Kate, neither art thou the worse for this poor furniture and mean array. If thou accountst it shame, lay it on me. And therefore, frolic, we will hence forthwith to feast and sport us at thy father's house. Uh, go, call my men and let us straight to him, and bring our horses unto Long Lane Ed. There we will mount and thither walk on foot. Let's see, I think it is now some seven o'clock. Well, we may come there by dinner time. I dare assure you, sir, it is almost two, and twill be supper time ere you come there. <coughs> it shall be seven ere I go to horse. Uh, look, what I speak or do or think to do, you're still crossing it. Oh, sirs, let alone. I will not go today. And ere I do, it shall be what o'clock I say it is. Why, so this gallant will command the sun. That was Hortensio. Excellent. Scene four. Enter Tranio as Lucentio, and the pedant dressed like Vincentio, booted and bareheaded. Sir, this is the house. Please it you that I call? Aye, what else? Ah, and but I be deceived. Signor Baptista may remember me near twenty years ago in Genua. Well, we were lodgers at the Pegasus. Tis well. And hold your own in any case with such austerity as longeth to her father. Enter Biondello. I warrant you. Oh, but sir, here comes your boy. To a good he was schooled. Fear you not him. Sir Biondello, now do your duty thoroughly, I advise you. Imagine for the right Vincentio. 
fear not me. But how shall they enter into Baptista? I told them that your father was at Venice and that you looked for him this day in Padua. Giving money. Thou art a tall fellow. Hold thee that to drink. Ah, here comes Baptista. Set your countenance, sir. Senior Baptista, you are happily met. Uh, sir, this is the gentleman I told you of. I pray you stand good father to me now. Give me Bianca for my company. The soft son. Sir, by your leave, having come to Padua to gather in some debts, my son, Lucentio, made me acquainted with a weighty cause of love between your daughter and himself, and for the good report I hear of you, and for the love he beareth to your daughter, and she to him, to stay him not too long, I am content in a good father's care to have him matched, and if you please to like no worse than I upon some agreement, me shall you find ready and willing, with one consent to have her so bestowed, for curious I cannot be with you, Signor Baptista, of whom I hear so well. Sir, pardon me in what I have to say. Your plainness and your shortness please me well. Right true it is that your son Lucentio here doth love my daughter, and she loveth him, or both dissemble deeply their affections. And therefore, if you say no more than this, that like a father you will deal with him and pass my daughter a sufficient dower, all well, the match is made and all is done. Your son shall have my daughter with consent. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Where then do you know best uh, we be affide and such assurance tin as shall with either part's agreement stand? Well, not in my house, Lucentio. For you know pitchers have ears, and I have many servants. Besides, old Grimio is hearkening still, and happily we might be interrupted. Well then, at my lodging, and it like you, uh, where doth my father lie? And there this night will pass the business privately and well. Send for your daughter by your servant here. My boy shall fetch the scrivener presently. The worst is this, that as for slender warning, you'd like to have a thin and slender pittance. Well, it likes me well. Can be out, hie you home, and bid Bianca make her ready straight. And if you will, tell what hath happened. Lucentio's father is a Arrived in Padua, and how she's like to be Lucentio's wife. Exit Lucentio. I pray the God she may with all my heart. Well, dally not with the gods, but get thee gone. Exit Biondello. Senior Baptista, shall I lead the way? Welcome. One mess is like to be your cheer. Come, sir, we will better it in Pisa. I follow you. Excellent. Scene five. Enter Lucentio and Biondello. Cambio! What says thou, Biondello? You saw my master wink and laugh upon you? Biondello, what of that? For faith, nothing. But he's left me here behind to expand the meaning or moral of his signs and tokens. I pray thee, moralize them. Well, then, thus. Baptista is safe, talking with the deceiving father of a deceitful son. And what of him? Well, his daughter is to be brought by you to the uh, supper. And then, the old priest at St. Luke's Church is at your command at all hours. And what of all this? Well, I cannot tell except they are busied about a counterfeit assurance. Take your assurance of her cum privilegio ad impremendum solum to the church, take the priest, clerk, and some sufficient honest witnesses. If this be not what you look for, I have no more to say but be Bianca farewell for ever and a day. Hearest thou, Biondello? I cannot tarry. I know a wench married in an afternoon as she went to the garden for parsley to stuff a rabbit, and so may you, sir, and so add you, sir. My master hath appointed me to go to St. Luke's to bid the priest be ready to attend against you come with your appendix. Exit. I may and will, if she be so contented. Oh, she will be pleased, and wherefore should I doubt? Hap what hap may, I'll roundly go about her. It shall go hard if Cambio go without her. Exit. Scene six. <coughs> Enter Petruccio, Catherine, Hortensio, and servants. Oh, come on, in God's name, once more to ward our fathers. Oh, good Lord, how bright and goodly shines the moon. The moon, the sun, it's not moonlight now. I say it is the moon that shines so bright. I know it is the sun that shines so bright. Now, by my mother's sun, and that's myself, it shall be moon or star or what I list or ere I journey to your father's house. Oh, go on, fetch your horses back again. Ever more crossed and crossed, nothing but crossed. Say as he says, or we shall never go. Revel forward, I pray. Since we have come so far, and be it moon or sun or what you please, and if you please to call it a rush candle, henceforth I vow it shall be so for me. Why well, say it is the moon? I know it is the moon. Well, nay, then you lie. It is the blessed sun. Well, then God be blessed. It is the blessed sun. But sun it is not when you say it is not. And the moon changes even as your mind. What you will have it named, even that it is. And so it shall be still for Catherine. Petruccio, go thy ways. The field is won. Well, for 
forward, forward. He thus the bowl should run, not unluckily against the bias. I was soft company is coming here. Enter an old man. Good morrow, ah, gentle mistress, where away? Tell me, sweet Kate, and tell me truly too, hast thou beheld a fresher gentlewoman? Such war of white and red within her cheeks. What stars do spangle heaven with such beauty as those two eyes become that heavenly face? Fair lovely maid, once more good day to thee. Sweet cat, embrace her for her beauty's sake. It will make the man mad to make the woman of him. Young budding virgin, fair and fresh and sweet, whither away or where is thy abode? Happy the parents of so fair a child, happier the man whom favourable stars allots thee for his lovely bedfellow. What <laughs> okay, I am now, Kate? I hope thou mad. This is a man, old, wrinkled, faded, withered, not a maiden, as thou sayest it is. Pardon, old father, oh, my mistaking eyes that have been well, so bedazzled with the sun that everything I look on seemeth green. Now I perceive thou art irreverent, father. Pardon, I pray me for my mad mistaking. Adieu, good old grandsire, and we'll all make known which way thou travellest. If along with us, we shall be joyful of thy company. Well, fair sir, and uh, you, my merry mistress, though with your strange encounter much amazed me. My name is called Vincentio, my dwelling Pisa. And bound I am to Padua there to visit a son of mine which long I uh, have not seen. What is his name? Uh, Lucentio, gentle sir. <laughs> Happily met. Well, the happier for thy son. And now by law as well as reverend age I may entitle thee my loving father. Oh, thy sister to my wife, this gentlewoman, thy son by this, hath married. I wonder not, nor be not grieved. She's of good esteem, a dowry wealthy and a worthy birth. Beside, so qualified as may beseem the spouse of any noble gentleman. Well, let me embrace with old Vincentio, and wonder we to see thy honest son, who will of thy arrival be full joyous. <laughs> oh, but is this true, or is it as your, your, your pleasure, like pleasant travellers, to break a jest upon the company you overtake? I do assure thee, father, so it is. Come, go along, and see the truth hereof, for our first merriment hath made thee jealous. Exeunt all but Hortensio. Well, Bertuccio, this has put me in heart. Have to my widow, and if she be froward, then thou hast taught Hortensio to be untoward. Exit. And that is Act 4. Act 3 is there, uh, and the last act when I have read it will go up there. There's a tip jar below if you want to leave any tips or there's comments if you want to ask what, what, what happened. Um, thank you for all that. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your likes. Thank you. I hope you're all doing tremendously. Bye-bye.